Chapter Three of How It Flies or Conquest of the Air. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. How It Flies or Conquest of the Air by Richard Ferris. Chapter Three Laws of Flight. If we were asked to explain the word flying to some foreigner who did not know what it meant, we should probably give as an illustration the bird. This would be because the bird is so closely associated in our thoughts with flying that we can hardly think of the one without the other. It is natural, therefore, that since men first had the desire to fly, they should study the form and motion of the birds in the air and try to copy them. Our ancestors built immense flopping wings into the frames of which they fastened themselves, and with great muscular exertion of arms and legs, strove to attain the results that the bird gets by apparently similar motions. However, this mental coupling of the bird with the laws of flight has been unfortunate for the achievement of flight by man. And this is true even to the present day, with its hundreds of successful flying machines that are not in the least like a bird. This wrongly coupled idea is so strong that scientific publications print pages of research by eminent contributors into the flight of birds, with the attempt to deduce lessons therefrom for the instruction of the builders and navigators of flying machines. These arguments are based on the belief that nature never makes a mistake, that she made the bird to fly, and therefore the bird must be the most perfect model for the successful flying machine. But the truth is, the bird was not made primarily to fly, any more than man was made to walk. Flying is an incident in the life of a bird, just as walking is an incident in the life of a man. Flying is simply a bird's way of getting about from place to place, on business or on pleasure, as the case may be. Santos Dumont, in his fascinating book My Airships, points out the folly of blindly following nature by showing that logically, such a procedure would compel us to build our locomotives on the plan of gigantic horses, with huge iron legs which would go galloping about the country in a ridiculously terrible fashion, and to construct our steamships on the plan of giant whales, with monstrous flapping fins and wildly lashing tails. Sir Hiram Maxim says something akin to this in his work Artificial and Natural Flight. Quote, it appears to me that there is nothing in nature which is more efficient or gets a better grip on the water than a well-made screw propeller, and no doubt there would have been fish with screw propellers, providing Dame Nature could have made an animal in two pieces. It is very evident that no living creature could be made in two pieces, and two pieces are necessary if one part is stationary and the other revolves. However, the tail and fins very often approximate to the action of propeller blades. They first turn to the right and then to the left, producing a sculling effect which is practically the same. This argument might also be used against locomotives. In all nature we do not find an animal travelling on wheels, but it is quite possible that a locomotive might be made that would walk on legs at the rate of two or three miles an hour but locomotives with wheels are able to travel at least three times as fast as the fleetest animal with legs, and to continue doing so for many hours at a time, even when attached to a very heavy load. In order to build a flying machine with flapping wings, to exactly imitate birds, a very complicated system of levers, cams, cranks, etc., would have to be employed, and these of themselves would weigh more than the wings would be able to lift. End quote. As with the man-contrived locomotive, so the perfected airship will be evolved from man's understanding of the obstacles to his navigation of the air, and his overcoming of them by his inventive genius. This will not be in nature's way, but in man's own way, and with cleverly designed machinery such as he has used to accomplish other seeming impossibilities. With the clearing up of wrong conceptions, the path will be open to more rapid and more enduring progress. When we consider the problems of flying, the first obstacle we encounter is the attraction which the earth has for us and for all other objects on its surface. This we call weight, and we are accustomed to measure it in pounds. Let us take, for example, a man whose body is attracted by the earth 
with a force or weight of one hundred and fifty pounds to enable him to rise into the air means must be contrived not only to counteract his weight but to lift him a force a little greater than one hundred and fifty pounds must be exerted we may attach to him a bag filled with some gas as hydrogen for which the earth has less attraction than it has for air and which the air will push out of the way and upward until a place above the earth is reached where the attraction of air and gas is equal a bag of gas large enough to be pushed upward with a force equal to the weight of the man plus the weight of the bag and a little more for lifting power will carry the man up this is the principle of the ordinary balloon rising in the air is not flying it is a necessary step but real flying is to travel from place to place through the air to accomplish this some mechanism or machinery is needed to propel the man after he has been lifted into the air such machinery will have weight and the bag of gas must be enlarged to counterbalance it when this is done the man and the bag of gas may move through the air and with suitable rudders he may direct his course this combination of the lifting bag of gas and the propelling machinery constitutes a dirigible balloon or airship the airship is affected equally with the balloon by prevailing winds a breeze blowing ten miles an hour will carry a balloon at nearly that speed in the direction in which it is blowing suppose the aeronaut wishes to sail in the opposite direction if the machinery will propel his airship only ten miles an hour in a calm it will virtually stand still in the ten mile breeze if the machinery will propel his airship twenty miles an hour in a calm the ship will travel ten miles an hour as related to places on the earth's surface against the wind but so far as the air is concerned his speed through it is twenty miles an hour and each increase of speed meets increased resistance from the air and requires a greater expenditure of power to overcome to reduce this resistance to the least possible amount the globular form of the early balloon has been variously modified most modern airships have a cigar-shaped gas bag so called because the ends look like the tip of a cigar as far as is known this is the balloon that offers less resistance to the air than any other another mechanical means of getting up into the air was suggested by the flying of kites a pastime dating back at least two thousand years perhaps longer ordinarily a kite will not fly in a calm but with even a little breeze it will mount into the air by the upward thrust of the rushing breeze against its inclined surface being prevented from blowing away drifting by the pull of the kite string the same effect will be produced in a dead calm if the operator holding the string runs at a speed equal to that of the breeze with this important difference not only will the kite rise in the air but it will travel in the direction in which the operator is running a part of the energy of the runner's pull upon the string producing a forward motion provided he holds the string taut if we suppose the pull on the string to be replaced by an engine and revolving propeller in the kite exerting the same force we have exactly the principle of the aeroplane as it is of the greatest importance to possess a clear understanding of the natural processes we propose to use let us refer to any textbook on physics and review briefly some of the natural laws relating to motion and force which apply to the problem of flight a force is that power which changes or tends to change the position of a body whether it is in motion or at rest b a given force will produce the same effect whether the body on which it acts is acted upon by that force alone or by other forces at the same time c a force may be represented graphically by a straight line the point at which the force is applied being the beginning of the line the direction of the force being expressed by the direction of the line and the magnitude of the force being expressed by the length of the line d two or more forces acting upon a body are called component forces and the single force which would produce the same effect is called the resultant e when two component forces act in different directions the resultant may be found by applying the principle of the parallelogram of forces 
the lines c representing the components being made adjacent sides of a parallelogram and the diagonal drawn from the included angle representing the resultant in direction and magnitude f conversely a resultant motion may be resolved into its components by constructing a parallelogram upon it as the diagonal either one of the components being known taking up again the illustration of the kite flying in a calm let us construct a few diagrams to show graphically the forces at work upon the kite let the heavy line a b represent the centre line of the kite from top to bottom and c the point where the string is attached at which point we may suppose all the forces concentrate their action upon the plane of the kite obviously as the flyer of the kite is running in a horizontal direction the line indicating the pull of the string is to be drawn horizontal let it be expressed by c d the action of the air pressure being at right angles to the plane of the kite we draw the line c e representing that force but as this is a pressing force at the point c we may express it as a pulling force on the other side of the kite by the line c f equal to c e and in the opposite direction another force acting on the kite is its weight the attraction of gravity acting directly downward shown by c g we have given therefore the three forces c d c f and c g we now wish to find the value of the pull on the kite string c d in two other forces one of which shall be a lifting force acting directly upward and the other a propelling force acting in the direction in which we desire the kite to travel supposing it to represent an aeroplane for the moment we first construct a parallelogram on c f and c g and draw the diagonal c h which represents the resultant of those two forces we have then the two forces c d and c h acting on the point c to avoid obscuring the diagram with too many lines we draw a second figure showing just these two forces acting on the point c upon these we construct a new parallelogram and draw the diagonal c i expressing their resultant again drawing a new diagram showing this single force c i acting upon the point c we resolve that force into two components one c j vertically upward representing the lift the other c k horizontal representing the travelling power if the lines expressing these forces in the diagrams had been accurately drawn to scale the measurement of the two components last found would give definite results in pounds but the weight of a kite is too small to be thus diagrammed and only the principle was to be illustrated to be used later in the discussion of the aeroplane nor is the problem as simple as the illustration of the kite suggests for the air is compressible and is moreover set in motion in the form of a current by a body passing through it at anything like the ordinary speed of an aeroplane this has caused the curving of the planes from front to rear of the flying machine in contrast with the flat plane of the kite the reasoning is along this line suppose the main plane of an aeroplane six feet in depth from front to rear to be passing rapidly through the air inclined upward at a slight angle by the time two feet of this depth has passed a certain point the air at that point will have received a downward impulse or compression which will tend to make it flow in the direction of the angle of the plane the second and third divisions in the depth each of two feet will therefore be moving with a partial vacuum beneath the air having been drawn away by the first segment at the same time the pressure of the air from above remains the same and the result is that only the front edge of the plane is supported while two-thirds of its depth is pushed down this condition not only reduces the supporting surface to that of a plane two feet in depth but what is much worse releases a tipping force which tends to throw the plane over backward in order that the second section of the plane may bear upon the air beneath it with a pressure equal to that of the first it must be inclined downward at double the angle with the horizon of the first section this will in turn give to the air beneath it a new direction the third section of the plane must then be set at a still deeper angle to give it support 
connecting these several directions with a smoothly flowing line without angles we get the curved line of section to which the main planes of aeroplanes are bent with these principles in mind it is in order to apply them to the understanding of how an aeroplane flies wilbur wright when asked what kept his machine up in the air why it did not fall to the ground replied it stays up because it doesn't have time to fall just what he meant by this is illustrated by referring to the common sport of skipping stones upon the surface of still water a flat stone is selected and it is thrown at a high speed so that the flat surface touches the water it continues skipping again and again until its speed is so reduced that the water where it touches last has time to get out of the way and the weight of the stone carries it to the bottom on the same principle a person skating swiftly across very thin ice will pass safely over it if he goes so fast that the ice hasn't time to break and give way beneath his weight this explains why an aeroplane must move swiftly to stay up in the air which has much less density than either water or ice the minimum speed at which an aeroplane can remain in the air depends largely upon its weight the heavier it is the faster it must go just as a large man must move faster over thin ice than a small boy at some aviation contests prizes have been awarded for the slowest speed made by an aeroplane so far the slowest on record is that of twenty one point two nine miles an hour made by captain dixon at the lanark meet scotland in august nineteen ten as the usual rate of speed is about forty six miles an hour that is slow for an aeroplane and as dixon's machine is much heavier than some others the curtis machine for instance it is remarkably slow for that type of aeroplane just what is to be gained by offering a prize for slowest speed is difficult to conjecture it is like offering a prize to a crowd of boys for the one who can skate slowest over thin ice the minimum speed is the most dangerous with the aeroplane as with the skater other things being equal the highest speed is the safest for an aeroplane even when his engine stops in mid-air the aviator is compelled to keep up speed sufficient to prevent a fall by gliding swiftly downward until the very moment of landing the air surface necessary to float a plane is spread out in one area in the monoplane and divided into two areas one above the other and six to nine feet apart in the biplane if closer than this the disturbance of the air by the passage of one plane affects the supporting power of the other it has been suggested that better results in the line of carrying power would be secured by so placing the upper plane that its front edge is a little back of the rear edge of the lower plane in order that it may enter air that is wholly free from any currents produced by the rushing of the lower plane as yet there is a difference of opinion among the principal aeroplane builders as to where the propeller should be placed all of the monoplanes have it in front of the main plane most of the biplanes have it behind the main plane some have it between the two planes if it is in front it works in undisturbed air but throws its wake upon the plane if it is in the rear the air is full of currents caused by the passage of the planes but the planes have smooth air to glide in as both types of machine are eminently successful the question may not be so important as it seems to the disputants the exact form of curve for the planes has not been decided upon experience has proven that of two aeroplanes having the same surface and run at the same speed one may be able to lift twice as much as the other because of the better curvature of its planes the action of the air when surfaces are driven through it is not fully understood indeed the form of plane shown in the accompanying figure is called the aeroplane paradox if driven in either direction it leaves the air with a downward trend and therefore exerts a proportional lifting power if half of the plane is taken away the other half is pressed downward all of the lifting effect is in the curving of the top side it seems desirable therefore that such essential factors should be thoroughly worked out understood and applied End of chapter 3